Welcome to this lecture number 23 on the NPTEL course on fluid mechanics for chemical engineering undergraduate students. The topic of our discussion in the last lecture was differential momentum balance and we were proceeding towards the derivation of the complete differential momentum balance and in that context we introduced the notion of the stress tensor. Okay. The differential momentum balance is essentially derived the way we did it is to take an infinitesimal control volume of a simple geometry let us say cube okay, and of sides delta x delta y delta z in the three quarter directions that is the volume of the cube delta by x times delta y times delta z. And <coughs> Essentially, we wrote down the integral momentum balance as applied to a control volume in the limit as the size of the control volume shrinks to a point. Okay. Then we obtain the following simplified relation. We, we obtain the fact that sum of all forces acting on this control volume is equal to rho times the substantial derivative of velocity times del v where del v is the volume of the control uh, infinitesimal control volume. Now, there are two contributions to forces acting on the control volume. One are called body forces, the other types of forces are called surface forces. Body forces a common example is gravity. Okay. So, if you have a fluid with density rho in present in the control volume and the acceleration due to gravity vector is g, then the force acting on this control volume is mass times g m g m mass is rho times the volume. So, g is acceleration due to gravity, this, this is the body force if the body force is gravity is due to gravity. There could be other body forces such as electrical body forces uh, present in ionic liquids uh, or magnetic body forces. Uh, those will not be of concern to us in this uh, introductory course, okay. uh, but the most common body force that is encountered in many applications is of course, gravity. So, that will be uh, the uh, force that we will include um, uh, in this discussion in our course. Okay. Now, surface forces are little more tricky. Now, uh, the surface forces are due to the fact that suppose you have a surface okay, of that cube which we just drew and let us draw it the full cube. Okay. There are six faces to the cube okay. x, y and z. Okay. So, each face is denoted by a unit outward normal. So, this face has a unit outward normal n is in the plus i direction, whereas this face has a unit outward normal n is in the minus i direction. Likewise, this face has unit outward normal n is in the plus j direction and this face has unit outward normal in the minus j direction. Okay. Likewise, you can do it in the plus k and minus k direction. I will refrain from doing that because it will um, uh, it will not it will reduce the clarity of the picture uh, because one cannot draw three dimensional uh, pictures very well uh, in 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 a, in a paper okay so i'll just leave it like this now uh, on each face in general the force exerted by the fluid that is present outside on this face can in general be in some direction okay that force is since we are all we are considering only infinitesimal forces i'll denote it with a delta f okay the force can act in general on a given surface in an arbitrary direction. This force okay, acting on a surface whose unit normal is in the direction n can have two components in general. Suppose, I take an arbitrary surface okay, of area delta a and unit normal n. Okay. There can be two contributions to the forces. One is the uh, direction along the normal those are called the normal forces 
and then the, the there are two tangential directions to this uh, surface. So, there will be two uh, components along the direction of the tangent. So, okay, in general you will have delta f t 1 delta f t 2 along the two tangential directions on the surface. Okay. So, the normal forces are the normal forces are sim are predominantly due to pressure because pressure acts purely normally plus also due to the fact that there could be normal viscous stresses. The tangential forces are purely due to are also called as shearing forces or shear stresses if you define it in terms of per unit area these are only due to viscous stresses in a fluid. Okay. So, it is normally uh, convenient to write the force per unit area as the normals force per unit area sigma n as limit delta a tending to 0 okay, delta f n by delta a and likewise the shear stress is denoted as tau n 1 is limit delta a tending to 0 delta f t 1. Okay. So, tau t 1 okay. uh, let me explain the notation. Uh, this denotes the fact that you are considering a surface whose unit normal is in the n direction and this is the tangential vector in the one direction and that similarly there is also a tangential force in the other direction. All we are saying is that for any given plane any surface with an arbitrary orientation n the force that acts on that surface due to the fact that fluid is the neighboring fluid. Uh, the force exerted by the neighboring fluid on this surface could have three components one along the normal and two in the two tangential directions along the surface that is all we are saying. But now we have considered a cube with six faces in our control volume x y and z. Okay. So, each face will have three components this face will have the unit normal is in the uh, plus i direction okay. and in general the force exerted will be okay. the force exerted will have three components. So, the three components of the force are we can write this as one along the normal direction which is actually the x direction here because that is the direction of the unit normal and then the two tangential directions are y and z. So, delta f y and delta f z. Okay. So, we can write three components of the stresses the force per unit area as follows sigma x x. Okay. So, let me write the two x's in two colors sigma x and I will explain you the reason write it slightly bigger sigma x x is equal to limit delta a tending to 0 okay delta a tending to 0 where a x is the let us say this is the area of this face with unit outward normal in the plus x direction delta f x by delta a x. This is the normal component of the stress acting on that surface. The shear stresses are usually denoted by tau the Greek symbol tau. Okay. So, uh, now I am going to use two colors to the two subscripts tau x y okay, is equal to limit delta a x tending to 0, because that is the phase we are considering, but the force is now in the y direction. The area on which the force is acting is in the x direction. Similarly, you can have tau x 
x z is equal to a limit delta a x tending to 0 delta f z with delta a x. Now, let me explain the colors for the two subscripts. The, let me explain the reason for the two subscripts. The subscripts in the orange color refers to the direction of the unit normal to the surface, the unit outward normal to the surface on which we are considering the forces. Okay. So, this tells you the orientation of the surface. surface orientation. Okay. Okay, now, uh, that is the purpose of the first subscript. The second subscript, the green subscripts tell you the direction of the forces. The forces can act in either x, y or z direction on a surface whose unit normal is in the plus x direction which is i. So, this on this surface you could have forces with three components. So, therefore, you need two subscripts to denote the uh, two issues that is one is the direction of the force, the direction the other is the direction of the unit outward normal to the surface on which we are considering the force. Likewise, you could also write tau y x sigma y y tau y z. This is you, you consider a face whose unit normal is in the y direction j direction and you are considering the forces in the x, y and z. So, the first subscript okay, denotes the direction of the unit outward normal and the second subscript tells you the direction of the force. So, you need two subscripts and likewise you can have in the on a plane whose unit normal is in the z direction that is plus k okay, tau z x tau z y and sigma z z. Okay. So, as the control volume shrinks to a small point okay, this the forces on this tiny cubic volume element can be summarized as an array of numbers sigma x x tau x y tau x z sigma sorry tau y x sigma y y tau y z tau z x tau z y sigma z z. Okay. So, this is an array of numbers that describe the state of stress on a cubic volume element with nicely defined surfaces along the three coordinate directions x, y and z namely. Okay. Now, what is the this is this collection of num, the state of stress present in a, in a fluid is called the stress tensor. Why is it called a tensor? It is because of the following reason. If you have a vector like velocity, you can write it as V x times i plus V y times j plus V z times k. Okay. You need only one subscript to denote the direction of the components in which the velocity is pointing. Velocity has is a vector has only one direction associated with it, one physical direction associated with it, namely the direction of the velocity itself. But if you consider something like a stress, okay, which is denoted with two underlines, two underlines to denote that it is something more higher than a vector, it is actually a tensor because it has two physical directions associated with it. associated with it. So, velocity is a vector, the stress is a tensor. Okay. 
Now, what are those two physical directions? The two physical directions are okay, the direction of the unit normal on which the force is acting and the direction of the force itself. Okay. Stress is force divided by unit area, force as a vector has a direction and the area itself has a direction because of its orientation. Now, so at each and every point in the fluid if one has the knowledge of this matrix or the tensor sigma x x tau x y tau x z tau y x sigma y y tau y z tau z x tau z y. Okay. If one has the collection of this one has an information about these 9 elements, then there is a result due to Cauchy which states that if I have at a given point an orbit a surface with arbitrary orientation that is you have put a coordinate system x y z, but this orientation of the surface is not along any of the three directions x y and z, but it is an arbitrary orientation n x times i plus n y times j plus n z times k. It is it is oriented in an arbitrary fashion not necessarily along one of the three coordinate directions. Then and the area of the surface is delta a let us see. Then what is the force? Okay, the force on this surface will in general have three components in the x y and z direction. The question one can ask is what is the force acting on such a surface or the force per unit area what is the stress acting on such a surface. The answer due to Cauchy which I will not derive is that simply take the local value of the stress on this surface. Uh, take the stress tensor acting at that point. So, remember this is an infinitesimal it is a point and you have an infinitesimal area surrounding that point. Okay. So, at that point you should know what is the stress tensor sigma x x tau x y tau x z tau y x sigma y y tau y z tau z x tau z y sigma z z and according to Cauchy's result you simply have to do a matrix multiplication of the three components of the unit vectors okay, with the stress tensor. Okay. This is like a matrix multiplication of a matrix 3 by 3 matrix with a 3 by 1 vector. So, the answer will be a 3 by 1 vector okay, which is this. So, by having the knowledge of the stress tensor at a given point which the stretch sensor is a given point in the Cartesian coordinate system tells you what are the forces per unit area acting on directions which are perpendicular to the three unit vectors in the Cartesian frame, frame of reference. But if you have an arbitrary phase arbitrary area then you can get the force per unit area acting on that surface with an arbitrary orientation in this fashion by, but by merely multiplying the elements of the stress tensor or the stress matrix with the column vector containing uh, the uh, components of the unit vector. Okay. So, that is the power of uh, doing the Cauchy construction. Now, having understood what are the stresses acting uh, on the surface also the sign convention for the stress okay, which we mentioned last lecture. Suppose you have a surface that is pointing in the plus j direction and suppose we say that tau y x is 10 Newton per meter square this is the x direction this is the y direction. What this means is that you have a force. So, y re represents in our convention the direction of the unit normal. So, that is in the plus j direction x tells you the direction of the force. So, if it is positive tau y x is positive then the force of 10 Newton per meter square force per unit area that is it acts on the plus x direction on a surface whose unit normal is in the plus y direction. So, if you have both 
the direction of the unit normal and so if you have the answer of the stress tensor to be positive that means that both the direction of the unit normal and the direction of the force are positive or it could also be the following that on the same surface at the same point you could consider a unit vector in the minus j direction. You could consider an each, each plane has two unit normals one is the normal uh, pointing in outward direction other is the normal pointing in the inward direction. So, if you consider the unit vector to be pointing in the minus j direction then the force acting on this surface is in the minus x direction. This is plus x the magnitude of the force is 10 meters 10 newtons per meter square. So, if somebody says that you have a force or stress tau y axis plus 10 newton per meter square okay. it could either mean that in this it could either mean that a force of plus 10 is per newton per meter square is acting in the plus x direction in a surface on a surface whose unit normal is in the plus y direction or a force of 10 newton per meter square is acting in the minus x direction on a surface whose unit normal is in the minus y direction. Okay. So, that is the meaning of positive terms positive stress values. Okay. Suppose you have negative stress values if somebody says the element of a stress tensor is negative that means the following if you have a unit normal in the plus j direction the force is acting in the minus x direction and the magnitude of the force is plus 10 uh, magnitude of the force is 10 okay. or vice versa if you consider the unit normal in the minus j direction then the magnitude of the force is in the plus x direction. The force acts in the direction of the force is in the plus x direction while the magnitude remains 10. Okay. So, if the stress value is negative then it means that the direction of the force and the direction of the unit normal are opposite to each other. If the stress value is positive then the direction of force and the direction of unit normal are along the same direction they both could be positive here or both could be negative. Here if one is negative the other is positive and vice versa if one is positive the other is negative. Okay. So, that is the sign convention for the stress tensor. Okay. Having done all this we went back to the differential momentum balance which simply said that is rho g times delta v plus the surface forces acting on uh, the cube. Okay. Now, the way we did was to consider each face of the cube sorry take each direction x y z. So, we first wrote down the x momentum balance how do we do that we did that by saying that take the x component of this equation delta v is rho g x delta v plus all the surface forces acting along the x direction on this uh, control volume. What are the various surface forces acting on the x direction on this phase there is a force sigma x x on this phase there is a force tau y x on the front face there is a force tau z x all these are pointing the direction of the force is remember the second subscript. So, all these are pointing in the z x direction, okay. but there are not just three phases there are also this opposite three phases which for which the unit normal is in the opposite direction we have to consider those forces as well and then use the Taylor series expansion for tau at x plus delta x in terms of tau at x to arrive at this simplified relation we finally, ended up with this equation rho d u d t delta v is delta v times rho g x plus partial sigma x x by partial x plus partial tau y x by partial y plus partial tau z x by partial z. Okay. So, the volume of the control volume drops out of the equation because both terms are multiplied by the same quantity. Now, we also said that in a static fluid 
the only force that is acting are the normal pressures. So, the stress tensor becomes and this pressure acts inward. So, you will have a minus p okay. in a static fluid the stress tensor is just this. In a flowing fluid under flow we want to write the stress tensor as this which would be the case if the fluid were to be static plus stresses that come up because of the viscous def, viscous resistance of the flow of the fluid. So, this is written as this is x y so sigma x x becomes minus p plus tau x x sigma y y becomes minus p plus tau y y and sigma z z becomes minus p plus tau z z. Okay. Under flow therefore, these are the terms that will happen only these are non zero only under flow non zero only if flow exists. Okay. This is these are the viscous stresses the stresses that come about because a fluid resists motion uh, continuous deformation. So, these are the viscous stresses that are generated by the fluid to resist the deformation. Okay. So, then we wrote rho d u d t is minus partial p partial x plus rho g x plus partial tau x x by partial x plus partial tau y x by partial y plus partial tau z x by partial z. Okay. This is the first term the x component the y component of the momentum balance this is x y and the z component Okay. So, these are the three momentum equations the differential form the momentum equations these are also sometimes referred to as the Cauchy momentum equations. These are the differential form of the momentum balance okay. these are also called the Cauchy momentum equations. And we also have the mass balance if you remember for an incompressible fluid. Okay the continuity equation which in Cartesian coordinate means so we have four equations three components of the momentum equation and one continuity equation so you have number of equations is equal to four so far and the number of unknown variables that we have we can count as follows okay three velocities the three components of the velocities one pressure and the nine components of the stress okay so the problem is highly underspecified because the number of equations so far 
is less than the number of unknowns. So, we cannot solve this problem. Okay. So, we cannot solve this problem as such right now. Okay. So, that is the uh, idea that we cannot solve the problem, because you have far too equations than unknowns. Now, uh, we have to look at the problem, how, why uh, we have this situation, okay, that we are not able to solve the problem completely. And that is because, we have not said anything about whether the material is a fluid or a solid, even now. Because all that we have done is to apply Newton's second law to a control volume, and then took the limit as the control volume shrunk to 0, size 0. Uh, uh, but nothing has been told so far whether the material that resists deformation is a fluid or a solid. That is the constitutive nature of the material has not yet figured in our framework. So, we need to specify something about the nature of the fluid. Okay. That will relate okay, the stresses to the velocities okay, and thereby we will be able to achieve some closure. But before that, we can also write down a equation for angular momentum. That will tell us that tau y x is tau x y, tau z x is tau x z, tau y z is tau z y. That is the stress tensor is asymmetric tensor, that is the matrix of elements is a symmetric matrix. That is you have, whether you write it like this tau x x, tau x y, tau y x, whenever you write it like this, these two terms are the same okay, and uh, these two terms are the same, the green terms and likewise these two pink terms are the same. Okay. They are the same, because it turns out that when you do the angular momentum balance and if there are no internal couples that generate angular momentum within the fluid, which is true for almost all fluids. Okay then one can show that the stress tensor is identically symmetric always. So, we are left with only a symmetric matrix has only 6 elements, because the, there are 3 equalities that relate uh, 3 uh, that give you 3 additional equations. Therefore, a symmetric matrix has only 6 independent components as opposed to the 9 uh, independent components for a second order tensor 6 independent components. But nonetheless, we are still uh, left with more unknowns than the number of equations that we have to solve them. So, we have to specify what is called the constitutive relation. Okay. In this context, uh, one way is to do one way to approach the problem of constitutive relations is to do experiments on known fluids and try to correlate the stresses with velocities and so on. That is one way and that is often done in labs to characterize fluids. The other way is to guess the form of constitutive relation based on some general principles. Okay. Now, let us try to um, guess the form of constitutive relation from an intuitive or physical point of view. Now, firstly, let us take a very simple system that is flow is happening between two plates okay, x and y, bottom plate is stationary static, top plate moves with the velocity v. Okay. So, you will have a velocity that looks like this okay, in between the two plates. Now, the question that one can ask is, the relevant component of the stress is you have a plate whose unit normal, I mean I am just drawing a cross section, actually it is a plate, it is extends whose unit normal is in the plus j direction. And the direction of the stress 
would be in the plus x direction. So, the component of stress will that will be of interest is tau y x. Okay. Now, what should tau y x be a function of? Okay. What can tau y x depend on? We can say that tau y x will depend on the velocity, okay. velocity of the flow, but that is not all because that does not tell you the whole story. Okay. Because if it just depends only on the velocity then you can say that well what about the distance between the two plates. Okay. Will it be the same if I have the same velocity, but a very large distance will it be the same if I have a very small distance. So, clearly the velocity uh, tau y x cannot be a function only of the velocity. Okay. Somehow the distance between the two plates have to come in. Okay. Also from a physical point of view the stress cannot be in a fluid if the entire fluid moves with a constant velocity then there cannot be any internal viscous stresses generated because that is merely rigid body motion. Okay. Stresses are generated in a fluid only if there is relative deformation between two points. Okay. Two points move past each other relative to each other. Okay. Now that so only then stresses will be viscous stresses will be generated. Now that part is accurately captured by what is called the gradient of velocity. So, stresses in a fluid cannot be generated purely by rigid body motion of the entire fluid. There has to be relative deformation between two points in a fluid and that is captured by what is called the gradient of velocity. That is if you have flow in the x direction the velocity component of interest is v x the x component of the velocity. If the x x onto the velocity is different at two different points, then we say that there is a gradient. So this is denoted by dvx by dy. Okay. So in this particular case, there is indeed a variation in velocity in the y direction. So there will be stresses that are generated because there is a difference in velocity at between two different points in the fluid. If you say both the plates are moving with a constant velocity v then of course, there would not be velocity gradients and there would not be any viscous stresses because this amounts to merely moving the entire fluid as a rigid uh, body. Okay. So, only gradients of velocity can generate stresses not absolute velocities. So, in this simple context which we just discussed okay, let me just show the picture here itself. Okay you have two plates one at um, uh, y equal to 0 other at y equals h okay, and the top plate is moving with the velocity v then the relevant component of the stress is tau y x because you are considering the force acting on uh, this part of the fluid that is the top surface okay, on in the x direction because that is a relevant component of the stress. So, tau y x must be proportional to dy. Okay. The constant of proportionality is called viscosity of the fluid. This is called the viscosity. Okay. Now, the dimensions of viscosity are can be estimated as follows. Stress is force per unit area. This is force divided by area. The dimensions of velocity gradients are simply 1 over time. Okay. So, the dimension of viscosity the stress can be written as m okay, is times t to the minus 1. If we take to the other side then the dimensions of viscosity is m l to the minus 1 t to the minus 1 kg per the units in SI units are kg per meter per second. Okay. So, this is a material property of the fluid, it is a material property of the fluid. of the fluid. Okay. So, this is the simplest expression 
because we considered a relatively simple flow between two parallel plates the flow is only in one direction and uh, but the in general the flow can be much more complex but before i go to that complex situation this is often called the newton's law of viscosity okay this is merely an expectation from uh, our side intuitive expectation from our side it is not guaranteed that all fluids should obey this expression this relation in fact many fluids do not okay for example if you consider uh, fluids like toothpaste or uh, shampoo or ketchup they do not uh, obey this relation they are much more complex okay but many simple fluids like air water glycerin and so on they do obey this simple relation such fluids are called newtonian fluids the fluids which obey the newton's law of viscosity which says that the stress the shear stress is directly proportional to the velocity gradient and the constant of proportionality which is a true constant it's independent of the flow parameters like velocity or velocity gradient okay is called the viscosity of the fluid okay now <coughs> this is for the simplest case but newton's law must also be written for the most general case so the newton's law of viscosity for the most general case where the stress the flow can be in all the three directions okay tau xy tau remember the stress tensor is symmetric okay from angular momentum balance so let us hope that i have used mu yeah use mu is the symbol used uh, for viscosity normally okay tau x z tau z x is mu tau x sorry tau y z is mu okay and then you have the normal stresses tau x normal viscous stresses is 2 mu okay is 2 mu tau z z is 2 mu partial w by partial z okay and this is the constitutive relation these are called constitutive relations because they tell they they have some information about the constituent material that uh, that make up the fluid these are called constitutive relations and the ones we have written are for a simple newtonian fluid such as air and water okay now we have written all the stresses in terms of the velocities or gradients of velocity so now we have exactly the same number of equations as you have unknowns because you have three momentum equations and one continuity equation and we have three components of velocity and one pressure as the unknown okay so that completely specifies the problem okay so now let us substitute all this in the momentum equation so let's go step by step uh, for the x momentum equation plus rho x plus we had partial tau x x by partial x plus partial tau y x by partial y plus partial tau z x by partial z. Now, let us substitute all the three components. So, let us I am going to focus only on this term now okay, and, and then we can substitute this back in this expression. I am going to substitute each terms partial tau x x is 2 mu partial u by partial x plus partial tau y x is mu plus 
plus partial tau z x is mu plus partial u partial z. Okay. Now, I can write the first term as since it is 2, I can write it as sum of two terms partial partial x mu partial u partial x plus again the same thing. Now, in all these equations, I am going to take out, I am going to write the first term separated, all the other two, sorry, all the other two uh, terms. I am going to write separate out the first term plus partial partial y of mu partial v partial x plus partial partial z of mu partial w partial x but still we have those two terms plus partial partial y of mu partial u partial y plus partial partial z of mu partial u partial z. Now, I'm the, the order of these um, derivatives partial derivatives are interchangeable. So, let me write this as partial partial x and we will assume that mu is constant independent of spatial portions. So, we can pull out mu okay, of partial u partial x that is from this term. Okay. We also have if you interchange these two partial derivations uh, derivatives, then you will have partial partial x or partial v partial y and likewise from this term if I interchange the partial derivatives, partial partial x of partial w partial z plus mu, then you can write this equation, this sorry this term as partial squared u partial x squared, this term as partial squared u partial y squared plus this term as partial squared u partial z squared. Now, this term is identically 0 from continuity equation. Okay. The mass conservation equation says this is identically partial u partial x plus partial v partial y plus partial w partial z is nothing but del dot v is 0. Okay. So, if you look at this expression, okay, the only thing that survives is that this becomes mu partial squared u partial x squared plus partial squared u partial y squared plus partial squared u partial z squared. So, I am going to write the x component okay, of the momentum equation after using the constant relation for the Newtonian fluid as rho the substantial derivative of the x component of the velocity is partial p partial x pressure gradient term rho g x the gravity term plus mu partial squared u by partial x squared plus partial squared u by partial y squared plus partial squared u by partial z squared. Okay. This is nothing but the Laplacian del squared of u, where del squared is the operator partial squared by partial x squared plus partial squared by partial y squared plus partial squared by partial z squared. Okay. So, the x component of the momentum equation can be simply written as rho partial substantial derivative of the velocity is minus partial p partial x pressure gradient term plus the gravity term plus the viscous stress term which becomes like this. So, I can write similar equations for the y component of the well momentum equation just by analogy. One can of course, go through the algebra in the same manner and you will end up 
the same thing. Okay. This is x component, y component. Okay. This is the z component. mu del square w and of course, one has the continuity equation mass conservation equation the mass balance differential form of mass balance which is partial u partial x plus partial v partial y plus partial w partial z is 0. Okay. Now, I can write this in a coordinate free form just as the mass conservation equation in a coordinate free form became del dot v 0. I can multiply these three components by the unit vectors and add them up and I will get the following equation d v d t is minus gradient of pressure plus rho g vector now plus mu del squared velocity vector. Okay. These two equations are called the Navier-Stokes equation for an incompressible fluid. for an incompressible Newtonian fluid. Okay. So, this is the mass balance, this is the differential momentum balance. Okay. So, the next task for us is to understand these equations by providing some solutions of these equations in simple physical context. We will continue this in the next lecture.